Hey friends, this is Joseph Maynard. Happy Sunday. And uh, I've, been, I've been spending all day preparing for this video. So hopefully it's a good video. There's go basically it's gonna be a video, I, I like to think of it as Spinoza plus plus, right? So if you look at my bookcase behind me, the only book that you can really make out is C++, which is basically the language of C with classes. This bookshelf behind me is actually my dad's computer engineering bookshelf. Um, one of these days, I'll give you guys a tour, and you can you can see weird languages like B and and Fortran and COBOL and Pascal and uh, all the different versions of Unix before Linux was even ever conceived of. Right. <clears throat> So I want this video to be about Spinoza plus plus, okay? That's what this video is gonna be. Now what is plus plus? Well, those of you guys who have a background in computer programming, you understand that plus plus is the iterative operator. It adds one, right? So you have the iterative operator and then you have the declarative operator which takes away one. And these are really useful when you're doing loops and you need to keep a counter, right? So you need to iterate or declarate one or add one. Um, reverse that. <laughs> so iterate is add one, dec dec uh, declamate is subtracting one. So Spinoza plus plus. So I want you guys to understand that <clears throat> this is my own commentary and extension of Spinoza. Even though I'm going to be saying Spinoza would say this, Spinoza would say that, this is not like a philosophical lecture on Spinoza, okay? Um, <clears throat> I will give those because those of you who were following my YouTube channel, you realize that I've been making videos on Spinoza now for over a year, right? Lots of videos on Spinoza. So um, I've studied, I've read all of Spinoza's works. Let me think, is there one work that I haven't really read through and through? I think the only work I haven't really read through and through is the uh, Tractatus Theologico Politicus. Okay? That's the only one that I haven't read through and through, but I've read <clears throat> all of his other works. Okay, enough to be able to understand his basic philosophy. Um, <clears throat> but intellectual, I want to be intellectually honest and say this is going to be a video that's going to be heavy on commentary. And I'm saying that uh, f more philosophical and sort of conservative videos on the ideas of Spinoza that cite chapter and verse will be coming on my channel. Okay, but you know, we have to crack on, don't we? We have to move on in life. We have to take Spinoza and put him in our backpack and somehow make use of Spinoza in our everyday life. So that's what this video is going to be about. I want you guys to understand that, that my teaching style is not to try to give the one right answer to anything. This makes me different from other teachers that are out there, including Spinoza, right? Spinoza sort of gives the, he gives the stance that he has the one right answer, right? That's not my teaching style. So I want you to know that in advance. I want you to understand in advance that sort of how I like to think about theory and development work. <clears throat> Theory is to be used, but then transcended, right? Because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is change something, right? Your life, the world, whatever it is. Uh, and so you have to have the maxim, like, you, like, do theory, don't let theory do you, okay? Because the mind and theory can get real tricky where all of a sudden that theory is doing you, right? You're being gaslighted by your own theory. And I think next week I'm gonna make a video on cults 
and uh, we'll talk about gaslighting in more detail next week. So, I want you guys to know that probably <clears throat> my first book is going to be on Spinoza. I want to write a, a book featuring, a, a development workbook featuring Spinoza. Um, and <clears throat> Spinoza gives us a really great account of what we might think of as the individual sovereign versus the collective sovereign. He raises the issue. And it doesn't really matter how he answers the question for the question to be what it is. And so you can think of philosopher philosophy as a series of answers, or you can think of philosophy as a series of questions. Right? The questions are actually more important than the answers are. So the, the, what, what makes Spinoza a great philosopher is the fact that he, he poses questions that were not posed before him. Or maybe that were in Indian philosophy, not so much in Western philosophy, right? Unless you go back to the pre-Socratics. But think about it. Think about the, the duality between the individual and the collective. And the collective individual. The, the difference, like, okay, so you have monism, which is the one. Pluralism, which is the many. You have the plural, which is the one. Right? So this is when you hear people that are that will tell you everything is one, you know? Everything is a plurality is one. So either everything is an illusion or everything is finite different things that all really are parts of the one. So Spinoza takes the latter view. <clears throat> so Spinoza takes the unorthodox view. Some might say the mystical view. Some might say the smarter view, that actually the collective wears the pants over the individual. And in fact, the collective is the true individual. Okay. So Spinoza, you're, you're going to ask yourself, you know, who is Spinoza? Is he a philosopher? Is he a mystic? Is he a spiritualist? Clearly, this is different thinking, right? So I want to take a, a moment right now to dedicate this video to uh, Claire Graves, Don Beck, and Christopher Cohen. The latter two wrote this book, Spiral Dynamics, which I think Spinoza would love. And so would Hegel, who actually was a pupil of Spinoza, right? Um, not directly, spent, you know, but indirectly. To the extent that when you start to study philosophy, what's going to happen is that all these philosophers are going to become sort of like your friends. I don't know if you guys remember in Goodwill Hunting, there's this scene where Will talks about all of his friends as being like these famous dead artists and philosophers. And somehow Robin Williams made them feel like, you should be ashamed of yourself because you don't have these feminine relationships in your life. Well, it's like, fuck you, right? You're taking the feminine over the masculine, right? The reality is, is that there's a lot of people that really could benefit, actually, from having Spinoza as a friend in their life, from having Hegel as a friend in their life. <clears throat> One of the things that happens as you study lots and lots of philosophy is you start to be able to really have these kinds of things like, what would Spinoza do, right? What would, what would Hume do? What would Hume say or do in this particular situation, right? How would Locke think about this? How would Benjamin Franklin, right, think about this situation? So you, you start to begin to, like, um, to be able to really take benefit of that. Um, kind of contemplation slash visualization slash dia inner dialogue or imagination work. Um, now,
I want to give you guys a model, a tiny little model. It's not going to be hard, okay? It's the four yogis model from Yoga Vedanta. And I think this model is a good model to kind of have in your mind, right, before we start jumping into all these different issues. And that's the four yogis model, okay? The idea that you have the jhana yogi, the karma yogi, the bhakti yogi, and the kriya yogi, okay? The four yogis. So yoga vedanta is, it's sort of like a life philosophy, philosophy, a spiritual system, you might say. You can make it religious. Um, <clears throat> it's a culture. You might call it a culture. Um, and they broke, they broke it up into these teaching, up into these four areas. Yogis are teachers. Yoga is a branch of Vedanta. Vedanta is a branch of orthodox Indian philosophy. Okay. So at the highest level of Indian philosophy, you have orthodox and unorthodox. Okay, orthodox is roughly Vedanta, unorthodox is roughly Buddhism. And Buddhism was like a reaction to Vedanta. So Vedanta is sort of like the masculine, right? It's the, the law. Buddhism is like chaos, right? So it's sort of like, Catholicism versus Protestantism. So Buddhism is more like Protestantism. It's challenging the orthodoxy. The orthodoxy is more like Vedanta. But see, there are like four different, four major branches of Vedanta. You already know about Advaita Vedanta. That's one of them. And then another one is Yoga Vedanta. And if you guys have heard of Sadguru, Sadguru actually comes out of the Yoga Vedanta rather than the Advaita Vedanta tradition. So in Yoga Vedanta, there are four types of teachers known as yogis. There's the Jnana Yogi, which is the yogi of knowledge, right? This is the, you're sitting in a classroom and you're like sitting there taking notes, you're in a lecture, right? That's the Jnana Yogi. The karma yogi is the life coach, right? The car I'm more of a karma yogi. Actually, I'm kind of a cross between all of these different yogis, okay? But my preference is to be a karma yogi. The karma yogi is focused on action, right? <clears throat> the karma yogi looks at the jhana yogi and says, these guys are just sitting around talking because they can't get themselves to take action, right? And oftentimes the jhana yogi will look down on the karma yogi and say, that guy's a fool. He's out there taking all that action, not knowing what we know that his life is foolish, right? So the jhana yogi likes to sort of rationalize to himself some kind of truth about everything else. The karma yogi is focused on right action, taking lots of right action, okay? That's the karma yogi. The bhakti yogi is the religious yogi, the religious teacher. So the bhakti yogi is here to teach spirituality and religion, okay? The relation between man and the whole. And you'll see how Spinoza talks about this. Um, the relationship between man and God, right? on death and dying. So this is the priestly yogi. Finally, we have the Kriya yogi. The Kriya yogi, sometimes it's not mentioned. I mention it. Um, I think it's an important branch. The Kriya yogi is focused on energy. So the Kriya yogi... <clears throat> is focused on harmony and balance. Um, they're not necessarily focused on action to the exclusion of intellect, like the karma yogi might be. They're not necessarily focused on the intellect to the exclusion of action, like the jhana yogi might be. They're not necessarily focused on God to the exclusion of the here and now, right? 
like uh, bhakti yogis are. They're focused on energy. I'll show you guys a, a book that Kriya yogis would love. <clears throat> Okay. This is a book called The Power of Full Engagement. Managing energy, not time, is the key to high performance and personal renewal. Right. So Kriya Yogis, they're all about energy theory and practice. And this is something I was actually getting ready to talk about on my YouTube channel, and we're, we'll talk about it. Probably before I move into yoga, um, Vedanta, I'll do a video on energy theory and practice or energy metaphysics. Now I'm fo I'm fo I'm I tend to be all of these right. I've integrated sort of all of them, but I tend to lead more towards the the um, karma yogi. And so I'm focused on action. So here's a book I could recommend to you guys. It's called Life Strategies by Phil McGraw. There's a chapter in here. I think it's chapter... Chapter 6, Life Rewards Action, right? This, to me, this is like... Uh, the greatest writing that I could ever read, almost, right? It, I, I would say it makes me want to nut, but I don't want to be gross, <laughs> right? It makes me sort of like as a life coach, just go like, oh, God, dude, I can't believe this is so good. Um, I'm not going to quote anything out of this chapter, but the point is, is that Action trumps thinking about anything, right? In fact, thinking is oftentimes exactly what holds you back. So I tend to have those kinds of proclivities to the karma yogi, right? I tend to think that, you know, which, what you need to do is to be able to get your mind right and then go take action and realize that no one's coming. Go create the life that you want, right? If you can't do that yet, and if you're you're sort of bypassing and talk and, and all this kind of stuff, you know, maybe uh, it's too good to be true, right? That theory is too good to be true. <clears throat> so one thing I want to talk about is yin versus yang or how I use masculine versus feminine. You guys hear me say this a lot, like the masculine this or the feminine that, or this is all yin versus yang dichotomy. This is a model. It's a useful organizing heuristic or tool, okay? I want you to take this with a grain of salt. It's a language. It's the ability to actually, it helps you see both sides of a, what we might call a paradox. So here's a book I'm gonna recommend for you guys. It's a book called Non-Duality, okay? In Buddhism and Beyond by David Loy. This will help you understand sort of the difference between a duality and non-duality, which is transcending a duality. A duality is a paradox. A monality is a position or a stance. Okay, so we have a monality, which is a stance, like this should be, this should be, or this is right, or this is wrong. That's a stance. A paradox would be, this is both right and wrong. It depends on the context, depend, depends on the perspective. Non-duality would be, um, it's neither. It's, it's actually both and neither. And ultimately, it depends on what I think about it, right? It's like, yeah, you, imagine you're the president sitting, sitting in the, uh, behind the, uh, the desk in the Oval Office. 
right? And you have all these aides that are coming to you and they're saying, good, bad, good, bad, maybe, maybe not, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, you as the president have to make that final judgment. So that's what it means to actually both integrate and transcend dualities, right? Is that you take a reasonable look and then you pull the trigger, but who pulls the trigger? All these people that are coming into your office, do they pull the trigger? Only if you let them. Ultimately, it's you that pulls the trigger, right? If you're taking 100% responsibility as the masculine. Okay, we'll talk about the difference between the masculine and the feminine. And it's not the masculine versus the feminine. It's not even the masculine and the feminine. All of this stuff is just talk. The best that this talk could be for you is to help you get ideas in your head that somehow align with the power for you to make changes to reality that correspond with your values and your goals, right? Don't lose sight of that. So I wanna really focus on Spinoza and masculine and feminine development work. And as the masculine, remember, masculine means yang, not men. So both men and women have these energies. In fact, you can see these energies in other things. Right? Um, it's just a model. Don't take this stuff, don't take these models too literally, okay? What's gonna happen is that you're gonna get stuck in some kind of intellectual framework and you're sort of gonna, you're gonna miss the trees for the forest. In other words, you're gonna have this conceptual model that's gonna blind you from being, being able to actually um, do what you really want to do, which is change your life and change the world. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about Spinoza and Zen Buddhism. The difference between Spinoza and Zen Buddhism, we'll probably do that at the end. Let me make a list here. One of the things I want to talk to you guys about before I take my first break and then we'll jump into the first topic. This is the end of the intro, right? Intro. Um, <clears throat> is one of the big things that I, that I want to really focus on is, is media addiction because I've had my internet turned off now for a week because my dad had oh one of these companies like Comcast or Xfinity or something like that and the bill was in his name and I haven't really had a chance yet to <clears throat> call them and take over the bill. So my internet has been cut off this week. And of course I don't watch television, I don't really do any web surfing on my phone. So I've had a week of experiencing what it's like to be in my house without really any media. And you know what? What I've discovered, guys, you're going to hate this. It's fucking great. It's great. It is so great. In fact, I think I'm going to keep it turned off because when I go to the law library, I can use the internet there. And I go there Monday through Friday from 8 eight to five anyway, right? So if there's anything I need to do on the internet, I can do it there. But it's been so great to not have media in my house and I've been able to sort of get over this media addiction and distraction. And I'm realizing now that if, if I start a forum, I wanna have a self-moderating community, okay? I'm not going to be somebody who's gonna be sitting here on the internet all day long managing something. That's no way to live your life, okay? I'm doing so many other things, right? I'm playing trumpet, I'm, I'm untangling tunes, I'm working on my writing, I'm like, I'm, you know, meditating. I mean, it's, it's amazing the difference uh, to not be hooked up even to my phone right? 
It's like, you know, people are texting you and they expect you to respond right away or whatever, you know, just turning my phone off, right? Um, having no television, no nothing, right? All the little creaks and sounds that you hear in the house that you never really heard before. Um, now what I do want to do, probably instead of setting up a forum, I might do a forum, but I'm only going to have people on the forum who are like personally vetted by me, right? So, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not just going to let any, anybody, I'm not trying to do like a big forum thing because most of my forum topics are going to be on philosophy and religion and kind of things that, you know, I want, <clears throat> I want it to be more like a collective blog than a collective uh, disaster. You know what I'm saying? So I'd rather have sort of like people that are at my level uh, or a little bit below or, or, or above um, on my, on, that, are, that are posting on my forum who don't need any supervision from me, where I can log in once a day and just make sure that like um, there's n nothing that's breaking the law happening, okay? All right. Oh, God. One album. Uh, this is the final thing I'll say here. <clears throat> okay, no. Actually, before I say that, one of the things I am interested in setting up is an accountabilities partner, accountability partners Discord server where um, next time I do a 90-day... Um, next time I do a 90-day challenge... I want people to be able to participate with that with me, right? And we'll have we'll have a list of all the categories like, you know, clean your toilet, nothing on the floor, read the, read four books, you know, um <clears throat> and all the all the little categories that I did cuz I'm I'm implementing that and it's amazing, right? I'm learning so much, but it it would be nice to to do that with other people. So I'm interested in doing that. Um but that doesn't need to be set up now. It's going to be 90 days plus a month. I'm going to have a month off. What I might do just to make it more amenable to people like students is I might do a challenge <clears throat> that's like a fall and spring challenge, right? Where you get your summer off. So summer is like your break and then fall is like, right? That's going to correspond to when you're in school. And so we'll do like a fall challenge where we'll do my 90 day challenge over the fall, right? And then the spring challenge, and then you'll have the summer. The summer will be like your dessert, right? And you should do something fun over your summer, like travel to Europe or, or something like that. Maybe during the fall and the spring, you get yourself a little part-time job where you save up for your flight and for your hotel room, right? So you pay for your dessert, right? Be responsible. <clears throat> Um, I find that um, a lot of the anger that I had in the last couple of weeks since my dad has passed away has sort of subsided, but I still find myself to be a warrior. So I've laughed about this with my friends. It's like, I'm no longer the angry warrior. I'm the peaceful warrior, right? <laughs> so we have a dichotomy between the angry warrior versus the peaceful warrior, but I'm still a warrior, right? But I'm a peaceful warrior. In other words, I'm at peace, but I'm still a warrior, right? <clears throat> so you don't necessarily have to be angry to be a warrior. Anger is an emotion that has pros and cons. Peace is an emotion that has pros and cons. But if you are a warrior, I guess what I'm saying is it kind of doesn't matter whether you're angry or at peace, right? Because your, your objective is still to take action on certain issues and be game plan driven. Okay, guys, so this is all by way of introduction, like big, long, twice as long as normal uh, introduction. But uh, I'll come back and we'll hit these different categories of where Spinoza and I agree and disagree. So again, I want this video to be thought of sort of like Spinoza plus plus.
So what we're going to do is we're going to milk Spinoza, we're going to use Spinoza, and we're going to take Spinoza to the next level. Okay, so just give me one second. Hey friends, welcome back. So, uh, you know, what I want to do, I've been thinking long and hard about how to start this second segment. I want to start it like this. Let's get down to the brass tacks, okay? There are two kinds of people. There are people that are comfortable with snake energy. And then there are people who are not comfortable with snake energy, right? They want the snake energy to be held sort of in the background, right? If you're going to be a snake, be a snake in the background. But in the foreground, you need to pretend like you're honorable, right? That's sort of the status quo, is it not? Right? Every human being is a snake, right? They're a complex adaptive system. They're looking after their own values, interests, survival, they're operating according to their own particular constitution, right? Their own personality, their own biology, their own philosophy. All of these things mix up into a soup, right? That non-linearly yields how you behave. And people can't quite backwards engineer that, right? They can't, like, you know, you can look at somebody's behavior and you're like, how the fuck do we, like, like, sort of, like, trace the causes back to a particular philosophical perspective that not only holds in this case, but holds in other cases, right? Which is the essence of science. Science is all about trying to find patterns, useful patterns in reality. Stop putting unreasonable expectations upon science. Science doesn't have anything to do with truth, right? Science plays its own games. Leave science alone, okay? Truth is something else, okay? Same thing with law. Stop thinking that truth has anything to do with law, right? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> from a philosophy of law perspective, from the perspective of the highest judges right? For any judge, okay? I would assume that any judge worth his or her salt would be a philosopher, not only of law, but of a philosopher, okay? You have to be a philosopher because a judge is being bombarded with, <clears throat> a judge is not an agent, right? So the law of agency doesn't apply to judges, Whereas a lawyer is an agent, right? A lawyer is partial. A judge is supposed to be impartial. They're supposed to be an umpire. So, like, the proper judge, in theory, would be coming from their own point of view plus, right, some influence, right? And, we, you know, maybe we could trace a biography, right, of those influences. Um, every judge undoubtedly has their own, as do you, okay? You're a judge. I want you to understand, you're a judge. You're the only judge in your life. <clears throat> Either you can accept responsibility for being that judge, right? or not. But if you do, you might you might start to actually develop a very kindred relationship to the famous US Supreme Court judges. Uh, and there are a lot of very amazing philosophical judges, you know, because the Supreme Court has been dealing with lots of big issues, right? I mean, at the end of the day, philosophy becomes relevant. You know, uh, ethics becomes relevant <clears throat> as well as tradition, as well as happenstance and evidence and all the sort of more pedestrian things that you learn in law school. 
Right. In addition to that, the, the great Supreme Court cases have to do with public policy, right? And we'll get into this, you know, later on in my videos, I'll talk about how it's not just the Congress that makes laws. Judges also make law. Okay. Make no bones about it. And tradition makes law. Tradition makes law, judges make law, Congress makes law, legislatures make law, okay? <clears throat> the executive in general is supposed to follow the law and to exercise actions and action plans to fulfill the law. That's the role of the executive, the role of the president, the role of you, if you think about it. If you think of reality as being a set of natural laws, <clears throat> and you're this actor that's within this, ma this ma matrix or network, then There's a balance of powers, is there not? I mean, in some sense, you don't have total free will. Like you thought you did. So one of the things about Spinoza that is <clears throat> really important. Sorry if I'm slow here. I'm trying to get my notes together. Is that you're not as much in control as you think you are. Okay? Okay. You're not, as, you're not as much in control as you think you are. Okay. And you'll notice this sometimes that your mind will be like, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm doing that. Okay. Now you can either fight that or you can accept that. If you accept it, you realize, well, sometimes my mind is ahead of my body. And sometimes... When you're like, oh, you know, I should be doing this, but I'm enjoying myself. You know, you have to realize that you just have to let it go, right? Sometimes you're just enjoying yourself. You have to let go, okay? If you're doing something else, what that means is that your body is not aligned with your mind. Your mind is ahead of your body or sort of a skew of your body. It's like, you know, hitting hitting the golf ball into the to the rough, okay, in golf. See, and Spinoza's going to talk about this. Spinoza's going to give us some advice about this, about how to avoid this. All right, guys? You see how I'm not just talking bullshit here? All right, this is, we're, we're getting to it, okay? It's going to take a little time. You know, this stuff is not easy, right? You spent a lot of time in your life learning different things, right? This is no different. Okay, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. <clears throat> so there are pros and cons. Let's get, let's get to this, okay, the basic. We all know that there are basically two kinds of ways to live in life. There's a very sort of like cutthroat, uh, personal way of handling things where you're only looking out for yourself and you're very mechanical about how you deal with things, okay? And we might, we might call this yang energy or masculine energy, okay? Masculine compassion is about logic and reason and what is probably going to happen. The masculine doesn't, doesn't fuck around, okay? The masculine is not concerned with what other people think. The masculine is like what is most likely to happen. Reason, right? Science. Mathematics, deduction, logic, 
the inevitable, the necessary. That's the masculine. Okay. The feminine is the partial, the fuzzy, fuzzy logic. Depends. Depends on where you were born, maybe. What culture you grew up in. Are you French? Are you English? Are you German? Are you Chinese? Are you Taiwanese? Are you uh, a Thailander? Are you Vietnamese? Or Thai. I should say Thai. Thailander, right? That just shows my ignorance. My brother lives in Thailand. Okay. So, I apologize for mispronouncing that. Are you Cambodian? I don't even think, is it Cambodia anymore? I don't know, right? My brother would know, so. Look at all these different cultures around the world, my God. I mean, if you look at art history, you know, it starts with Persia, Babylonia, right? Even before Egyptian art, we have art in Babylonia that goes back like 8,000 BC. Before writing was developed in Egypt, which I think was in 3,000 BC. Okay. Plato and Aristotle are like 500 BC. All right. Vedanta, well, it depends on who you're talking to and it depends on what you're looking at. Because Advaita Vedanta goes back way beyond Shankara. Shankara was actually, I think it was like uh, 1200. I could be wrong, right? Probably earlier, but Shankara was definitely AD. <clears throat> but Advaita Vedanta goes back beyond Shankara. But Advaita Vedanta goes back to the Vedas and the Upanishads, which are like... Um, millennia BC, right, before Plato and Aristotle, okay. On, on, the, on the same sort of timeline as the, Egypt. So the Greeks had a lot of respect for Egypt, right? So you had Egypt, you had India, you had China, and you had the Aegeans. The Aegeans were sort of like the, the, the new kids on the block, when it comes to this, okay? So you have the, right? Do you, and you understand, right? In terms of, of timeline, right? So the Chinese go way back, if you look at Chinese culture, right? Different dynasties and so on. India goes way back. And then the Aegeans pop on the scene. Um, sort of around like, let's just say 500 BC. Earlier than that, but... You know, when we look at like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, uh, Plotinus, Epicurus, right? You know, when we look at not only ancient Greece, but the Hellenistic Greece uh, and Alexander the Great and how Alexander, you know, really expanded Greek culture and then how the Romans took it over. So you have basically sort of like the true Middle Easterners, like the, the Iranians. And so we have like the Zoroastrians, right? The Zoroastrians, the Babylonians, right? And then we have Egypt, right? The culture of Egypt, the culture of the Nile. And then we have... Um, India, ancient India, ancient China, okay? These are like the great civilizations of the world. Ancient China, and then ancient Greece, and then ancient Rome, okay? The Romans, the Roman Empire. And then Europe comes after all of this culture, right? Sits up underneath Europe, okay? So Europe is very modern, believe it or not. Europe is very modern. Europe took advantage of all of these traditions through the Greeks, 
through the Romans, through the British, through the French, through the Germans, through the Americans, through the Australians, through the Canadians, okay? All of these people sort of come out of this Western philosophical tradition. And uh, so we really have three major philosophical traditions. Now, this view is both attractive to me and not attractive to me. Because on the other hand, on the one hand, I've always been a fighter for the small man, the small guy, right? I'm a true Democrat in that sense, right? I, I want everybody to, everybody's voice to be included. This goes back to my leadership. Um, I used to be the tribe chief in the Order of the Arrow when I was in the Boy Scouts. I was actually the tribe chief of the Maya Lodge in Sacramento. We would meet in Marysville when I was under the age of 18. And I used to have to preside over these meetings, right, where people would have these different contrasting sort of points of view. So from a very young age, I learned how to be a leader in that sense, right? So I want to include things like in philosophy, like let's open up the floodgates here. Let's include things like South American philosophy, African philosophy, Polynesian philosophy, Mexican philosophy, right? Um, every, let, let's open philosophy up, right? Because see, philosophy is so restricted, man. It's so anal because of the, the way that it's treated in Western universities. The way philosophy is treated in Western universities is not the way that we have to treat it culturally. We can take it back. We can take philosophy back from the universities. And, you know, half of the Western philosophers have been, you know, philosophy professors. The other half have just been regular people, okay? So the, the university does not sort of prima facie own philosophy, nor should it pretend to. All right, guys, so let me just take one second. Just give me one second. All right, guys, so let me just cut to the chase and just say the number one duty that you have in your life is to take care of yourself and to take care of your responsibilities, like the children that you bring into the world, the debts that you create in the world. Those are all your responsibility, regardless of what other people say, right? You need to take care of your own responsibilities. If you're unwilling to do that, you're not going to be a high character person. And Spinoza would say, that's fine, right? There are low character and high character people, and that's good because that's exactly what they're, what's real at any given moment in time, right? Nature is a signal to truth for Spinoza. If it's happening, it's good. So morality seems to get sort of the shaft here, right? Because if it's happening means that it's good, then moral seems to be something askew to that. And it is. So for Spinoza, human morality is not absolute truth. It's what he calls relative truth, okay? It's man's truth, not God's truth or the truth of the whole. So for Spinoza... <clears throat> God means the whole. Right. 
Now, one of the things that I tend to think that Spinoza probably wouldn't agree with is that I've got to be proud of myself as number one, right? Spinoza gives the nod to the whole, all right? So the whole is the sovereign. The whole is the thing. The collective is the thing. So you can see this is sort of like the feminine reaching up and sort of like striving for a facade of the masculine. But the feminine trying to become the masculine almost. But the whole is the one. The one is the masculine. The whole or the collective is the feminine. So it's the feminine trying to become the masculine is sort of stage turquoise. Okay, so I talked to you guys about this book here, Spiral Dynamics by Don Beck and Christopher Cohen. Now, they talk about turquoise, but you know, I want you guys to realize that when I talk about turquoise, I have my own views about turquoise. Okay, I'm not just talking about their perspective. I have my own views about turquoise. I have my own views about coral, teal, and mauve. Okay, that go beyond what they talk about in their book, but sort of follow that same Hegelian model that they work with. Okay, just give me one second, guys. I'm going through my notes here. So I want you guys to know that I've taught both feminine and masculine development work. And there's an issue between leading with the feminine versus leading with the masculine. The reality is that it doesn't work like this. You can break it down like this theoretically, but in reality, it's a nonlinear type of thing, okay? One of the things that I don't do is I don't like shaming people. And I'm going to fight people who do this or narratives who do this. I don't want to fight people, but I'm going to fight narratives that do this, which is the shaming communication style. So there's a book called Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw that gets you through this. There's a lot of shaming communication that's going on that... You know, I'm not, I'm not going to let go by because I think it's abusive. All right. So what we want to do is we want to talk about self-friendship versus relations, okay? So integrating and transcending family or friends. So Spinoza versus the traditional parent-child relationship. Now, Spinoza wants to say that everything is interdependent, right? So independence for Spinoza is a confused idea because the reality is that everything is one. The collective is one. The collective is the absolute, okay? <clears throat> but realize this even though everything is interdependent that doesn't mean that you're required to be in any relation with any other thing now you may say well that's unreasonable and i would say well if it's if it exists then it's good right so for spinoza there's always a tension between sort of like existence versus reason if it exists then it's good because it's the will of god but reason is always there to try to speak to a particular system to be able to improve itself right so one should both listen to reason which is the masculine and then also accept reality which is the feminine so you can see how Spinoza is 
sort of like stage turquoise, okay, in Spiral Dynamics. He's gone beyond binary, he's gone beyond sort of monistic thinking. There's only one way of looking at things. For Spinoza, it's like there's at least two, way of, two, two ways of looking at things. Sometimes one way wins out, okay? So Spinoza's at least stage yellow, okay? So you can see how Spinoza, if you weigh Spinoza against spiral dynamics, you can see how it at least takes you up to stage yellow, all right? Which is good in and of itself. <clears throat> So for Spinoza, even though everything is interdependent, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're particularly bound to any particular relation in reality. So for, in other words, like, yes, from a meta perspective, everything is connected, for, but from a local perspective, in the, in the, to the extent that you think of yourself as a thing, then you have the illusion of choosing your relations, right? And human beings have no, like, um, choice but to believe that they are individual sovereigns. It's false from a deeper perspective, but from a relative perspective, it's very much true that in your particular life, even though you may be watching yourself take right action, that right action is still based on true ideas or good ideas or better ideas than you might have had. So to the extent that you can become more... Uh, conscious of true ideas, the more reasonable your life is going to be for Spinoza. The more you're going to be able to take right action and avoid unreasonable suffering. Okay, so you can see the masculine, right? The faith in Reason. What is the root of rationalism? It's reason. So you can see how in Western philosophy, what the rationalists were is the rationalists were philosophers who thought that man's ordinary thinking is sort of fucked up, right? It's confused. And so... It's only through reason that man can actually sort of correct himself. And there's a great book. Let me see if I can. Uh, it's not here. I guess I took it out. Um, anyway, book recommendation nullified. Um, But living a life through reason means living a life through the mind, right? Living a intellectual sort of conscious life. Now we'll get into you know to, you know what extent intellectualism has to do with consciousness later on. But what Spinoza would say is that <clears throat> the thinking man's life. And so you can see how Spinoza sort of edges into philosophy and religion. Not religion, but uh, philosophy and spirituality. He sort of denounces religion. Um, he sees religion as sort of a way to, for the masses, to practice spirituality without really knowing the true spirituality. The true spirituality for Spinoza is realizing that the whole is a being. 
the whole as a being and that you're not really a being, right? You're fool's gold. You're not real gold. <clears throat> the real being is the whole or mother nature. Okay. Let that sink in. Mother nature. Imagine mother nature as being God. <clears throat> God is Mother Nature. The Sovereign is Mother Nature. And what you are is you're just a little finite piece of Mother Nature. Okay? That's, that kind of gets you close to Spinoza. If Spinoza... If it's happening, then it's good, right? Because the good <clears throat> is the will and the intellect of Mother Nature, right? So this is naturalism. What's the root of naturalism? It's nature. Ism just means theory of. So naturalism means theory of nature. What is nature? Well, what happens, right? So you can see how naturalism sort of clashes with religion, right? So naturalists tend to clash with religion because religion thinks it has moral duties that go beyond nature. Now, what Spinoza tries to do, sort of in, in anticipation of Kant, is he, he tries to sort of defend human morality by calling it relative. You may have heard people talk use these, this word relative versus absolute. So what relative means, that means like, you know, a particular sort of <clears throat> network of systems, network of similar systems, what their values are. That's relative. Okay, so if you look at reality, we can see that, you know, bacteria have their own values. Human beings have their own values. You guys should read this book. <clears throat> the Moral Animal. Why We Are the Way We Are, The New Science of Evolutionary Psychology by Robert Wright, right? So the question is, okay, we have all these like species that are in this Petri dish that have their own sort of morality or ethics, their own ego, egoism, right, in terms of what their systems want and what happens to their particular systems and so on. We can understand this in terms of a network of systems. But is there an objective law? or rule on top of all of this. Spinoza wants to say yes, and what he wants to say is it comes from reason. It comes from man's understanding of the distinction between reason versus falsity. Reason versus falsity. Okay, we're going to get into this. <clears throat> okay. So if I'm doing it, then it's good. Spinoza would say this is both true and false, okay? The true aspect of this is if it's happening, then it's good. The false aspect is that unless it's happening by true ideas, then it's less than the ideal standard from which or to which it could be happening. In other words, whatever particular system is engaging in this behavior is not actually optimal. 
It's not optimizing its own perfection. So you can see how Spinoza is very much sort of like a Platonist. He thinks that there's a sense in which there is such a thing as character. There is such a thing as virtue. There is such a thing as systems actually achieving virtue even if they have no free will. It happens from possession of true ideas. The more true ideas you possess as a system, the more reasonable you operate, the more reality gives you something that, per that perfects your particular system, right? And so this is grace, right? Systems that possess this, they didn't earn this. This is solely a matter of grace for Spinoza. It was bestowed upon a particular system by the whole. <clears throat> so Spinoza doesn't think that the individual human being has any sovereign control or sovereignty. And this is where I disagree with Spinoza. I think that Spinoza, although he gives a good view of stage turquoise, right? There are, there are stages that, that, are, that go beyond turquoise, like coral, okay? There are stages from which you can become conscious of the idea that I'm the sovereign. I'm the only sovereign, okay? Which is a masculine stage. It's sort of like stage red, but it's not stage red. Let's call it stage coral. Stage coral plus plus, right? Now there's a difference between stage coral, stage teal, and stage mauve, in my opinion, and I'll talk about those as we move on. And what those stages teach you is that the only person who can have unconditional love for you is you, right? Stop privileging the collective as an ontological subject matter. Maybe friendship is a hoax. Maybe nobody has unconditional love. And maybe strife is the norm, right? Instead of peace, these people that are addicted to peace. Maybe getting over the idea of social approval is necessary to have an assertive style of communication. Maybe individual sovereignty is the ultimate good of masculine development work. Maybe doing the right thing is not always in service of social harmony, but rather in service of the self. The self as the sovereign individual who doesn't necessarily need to be God. So maybe surrender versus sovereignty or the, or the feminine versus the masculine, respectively, doesn't have anything to do with God, right? Maybe surrender is just something that you're going to have to figure out how that fits into your life. Sovereignty, likewise, you're going to have to figure out how that fits into your life. Maybe instead of worshiping the whole, maybe you should worship the self. Maybe you need more self-friendship because you're out there people-pleasing and you're giving a filtered version of yourself to reality instead of an unfiltered version of yourself.
right, guys. So that's all by way of the first segment of this video. Let me just take one second and I'll come back and we'll start the next segment. Just give me one second. All right, guys. So now we're going to move into Spinoza's ethics and spirituality. Okay. So what Spinoza thought is that it's the whole, right, holism that's really driving the, the gravy train here, the train, right? <clears throat> holism, the will comes from the whole. You're a part. The part doesn't have any say. The part is basically being sort of like battered around, but it doesn't realize it's being battered around. In its own perception, it sees itself as a sovereign, but that's an illusion for Spinoza. So Spinoza, you see, he gives the he gives the nod to the collective sovereign, the feminine, right? The feminine is the whole, holism, right? That particular monistic perspective is yin. Yang is the sovereign part, right? The finite mode that realizes that he's the sovereign for himself. And that no other voice or justification is needed beyond that. And so we, what we can see here is a distinction between stage turquoise and stage coral in spiral dynamics, okay, in my perspective. Now, Glenn Beck, Claire Graves, and Cohen, they don't talk about stage coral, okay? But if I ever get my YouTube videos restored... I talked a lot about coral, teal, and mauve, and I can still talk about those. Okay, so nothing has been lost, even though they took away my material. Nothing has been lost because it all came out of me, right? See, that's one of the benefits of making yourself your, your own fountain, right? Uh, is that if somebody cuts off your material, it doesn't take anything away from you because... It was all generated out of you to begin with, right? It's like Ross Perot said, right? You're going to have oil wells that are pumping money, right? Once you figure out what your life purpose is, right? Because there's going to be an unlimited source underlying that. And we'll talk about more about Ross Perot okay, as time goes on, which is one of my uh, mentors. And I believe Ross Perot was also an Eagle Scout. So Spinoza, does he give a nod to masculine sovereignty? I would say yes and no, not enough, okay? Spinoza is two-stage turquoise to really be a stage coral figure, in my opinion. Stage coral is all about individual sovereignty, okay? Army of one. Stage turquoise, I'm sorry, stage coral sounds like stage red, but see, here's the difference. Stage red is trying to be God, right? They're trying to fashion themselves into a God in the world by acting like a devil, right? Stage coral realizes that there's no need to act like God. You already are God, okay? Stage coral realizes I am God, okay? Not we are God or the collective is God. Okay, so turquoise is like the collective is God, which is the feminine, right? The feminine metaphysical perspective. I am God is the masculine metaphysical perspective. Now, when you move into stage teal, you transcend philosophy and metaphysics and you move into something else. Let's call it non-duality, okay? And when you move into stage mauve, you move into something else. Let's call it Zen, okay? Now, these are my views, and I'll unpack these as we move on. So there's a dichotomy between reason versus acceptance, right? Reason is the masculine. Acceptance is the feminine. What does Spinoza think about Christianity? Spinoza thinks Christianity is a finite picture of spirituality, but not the true picture of spirituality. 
The true picture of spirituality is that the whole is the sovereign. The whole is nature. And nature is God. Nature brings you in. Nature brings you out. Everything that exists is a part of nature. Right? It's a very sort of pan-scientific view, in my opinion. Right? But it's much more higher consciousness. It's staged turquoise, right? I believe it's staged turquoise in the spiral dynamics model. So it's a good, it's a good, now we'll get into why it's staged turquoise later on, but just, you know, for right now, I just want to sort of say that, okay, by the book. So what causes suffering for Spinoza? You know, the, the one thing that causes suffering for Spinoza is realizing that you're not a part of the whole. It's thinking that you're you're an, you're independent. That is the most egregious thing for Spinoza, to not realize your own interdependence, your own role in the community of life. And so, for Spinoza, the thing to understand is like yes, there there is war and peace and all this sort of strife, right? Um, and that's part of the good. All of that is good because it's all what's here and what's here is good. So Spinoza thinks that religion is basically a fairy tale. All right. Let's just get that on the table. Spinoza, Spinoza also doesn't really like the religious nice guy, right? thinks that the nice guy syndrome or the humble devil is actually a sneaky ego. Because see, for Spinoza, just like for Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Belson, right? Ego is um, the main feature of the collective whole, right? Is sort of like these systems that are all interacting and, and, and with each other, okay? Their own interests their own power, their own sort of organization, and, and come see what may, right? Um, for Spinoza, most of humanity is ignorant of absolute love. What is absolute love? Absolute love is realizing that the whole is one. So nature is one. All of us are all part of one organism. Now it's an organism, right? One being. It's like your liver decided that it would be a separate thing, right? For Spinoza, to, for you to decide that you're going to be a sovereign. All right. Now on the other hand... Spinoza would say that man has no choice but to think of himself as an individual, even though that's false, because of Maya, right? And reason is good for man. So to the extent that man can align with reason is the extent to which man can align with the divine for Spinoza. So you can see how Spinoza is very much a rationalist. Uh, there are pros and cons. Well, let's just say it like this. There's a lot of cash value to the reasonable versus unreasonable dichotomy. right? That's used a lot in law. We talk about unreasonable or reasonable. So, you know, rationalism has a lot of cash value in culture including but not limited to law. In mathematics, right? Reasonable versus unreasonable has a lot of cash value. Philosophy, ditto. And I would say in mysticism, you know, mysticism tends to transcend that a little bit. And that's why we get into the question, well, is Spinoza a true mystic or is he more of a philosopher and so on, right? Well, you know, he uses a lot of reason in his views or his justifications for his views, right? So is he is Spinoza a true mystic or is he a philosopher? Or is he sort of like a philosopher that's 
posing a picture of mysticism, but he's doing it philosophically. See, he's not a true mystic. He's a philosopher sort of like trying to justify a picture of mysticism. Do you understand the difference? Just like you might have somebody who's giving you a picture of the feminine, but they're doing it in a masculine way. Like they're, they're giving it to you like it's the unvarnished truth, but it's a picture of the feminine. See, that would be sort of like the masculine giving a picture of the feminine or the feminine giving a picture of the masculine. I don't know what that would look like. I'll, I'll let you figure that one out. Um, maybe like dressing a certain way with the baggy pants and the, you know, the, like the look, right? The look and the talk and the facade and the fakeness of the masculine being sort of emphasized as opposed to like the, the true masculine, which is the character of the masculine, right? See, what makes the masculine is judgment, right? The masculine judges. That's what the masculine is. The masculine is the hunter. The feminine is the nurturer. See, what you're going to find is that in your development work, you're going to have to integrate both of these together. They don't exist independently, although it's useful to think of them independently, right? ultimately they're both going to coexist within you and then you're going to have to kick this theory away, right? Because this duality between the hunter and the nurturer is just an idea. Let's see, the theory gets flushed down the toilet. So this is why I'd be very careful about intellectuals, right? Because at the end of the day, theory gets flushed down the toilet in development work, in your life. And okay. So God's decision versus my decision. This is where Spinoza, I think, gets a little bit too feminine, where he tends to think... He tends to give the nod to what happens is the good instead of what I choose is the good, okay? From the masculine perspective, what I choose is the good, what I decide is the good. Ultimately, that's the only test. There's only one test, and that's my acceptance or rejection from the masculine perspective. Spinoza wants to make this seem like no, the, the, the true test is what happens is the good, okay? But see, what this does is this keeps you from taking your power, right? Spinoza wants to say, no, you don't have any power. God has all the power. All your power is illusory. So you can see how Spinoza is too feminine, too stuck in stage turquoise. You're going to have to bump up to stage coral and beyond coral to really understand sort of the limitations here. All right, guys, you know, th this video can go on forever. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it here. In the next couple few videos, we're going to continue on with Spinoza. We're going to talk about power, passions versus emotions. Okay, passions versus emotions. We're going to talk about power and ego. We're going to talk about Death and dying. We're going to talk about man versus nature. We're going to talk about freedom. We're going to talk about mind versus body. We're going to talk about reason versus falsity. We're going to talk about Spinoza versus Zen. And because I promised to cover this by the end of this video, let's do that. 
Spinoza versus Zen. What is Zen? Zen is Japanese Buddhism. Okay? It comes from Chan Buddhism, which comes from China. Before that, it came from India. And it, it was transferred from India into China, into Japan, into Korea, and so on. East Asian philosophy. But with a Japanese twist. So here's the difference between Zen and Spinoza. They share a lot in common. They, they're both sort of mystics. Okay, you're going from philosophy to mysticism when you're dealing with Spinoza and when you're dealing with Zen. Spinoza is a philosopher, but he's also pushing into mysticism. All right. Um, what's the difference? Well, Spinoza is much more an, or like an orthodox. He's much more like Vedantin, right? He, he, he thinks that in some sense there's, he's masculine. He thinks that there's, there's, a, there's a story that is true about reality. And to the extent that human beings can have access to this story that is true about reality, they can solve a lot of problems in their lives and in other people's lives. And you can see how this is similar to like religion, philosophies, people they think have the truth, know-it-alls, control freaks who try to gaslight people into thinking that they know the truth, right? Anybody who's sort of like pushing a narrative is operating within the masculine. Now you can be the masculine pushing the feminine too, which is interesting, I've seen that, and that's, that's something we can talk about later. But the feminine is about Everybody is a unique snowflake, right? This is what the conservatives don't like. But maybe this is in their shadow, right? At the end of the day, they're the snowflake and they're reacting toward everybody else, right? Because they have to be special. But the reality is, is that we're all different, are we not? I'm an ENTJ, right? Um, I already said I'm an Enneagram type four which is the um, eccentric. I'm a sexual, social, self pres dom in terms of Enneagram theory. So each of us has a different sort of personality and we're interacting with each other in a network of systems. See, Spinoza really lays the foundation for this as well. We'll talk about that. Um, So I don't think that Spinoza would, would agree with me when I say that if I'm doing it, then it's good, right? I think he would say yes and no. I think he would say, you know, look, if it's happening, then it's the will of God and it's good. But that doesn't preclude your system of the responsibility for acquiring more true ideas than what you currently have. Even if it's not through your own effort, right? You should always be trying to be more reasonable, which is the masculine component of Spinoza, right? The, Spinoza, the masculine component of Spinoza is to, to always be trying to become more reasonable. The feminine component of Spinoza is to realize if it's happening in the now, it's good because it's the will of the whole. And Spinoza privileges the whole as the sovereign. Stage turquoise. But that's a stance. That's a masculine stance. And it's also, it's sort of a monality, you know, it's sort of giving the nod to yin. And I can understand why Spinoza would do this. But as Hegel understood, it's much more complicated. There's a much more complicated back and forth dynamic sort of change kind of thing happening than what Spinoza laid out here. But Spinoza clearly lays the groundwork. All right, guys, even though I wasn't able to cover nearly as much as I wanted to cover in this video, 
I don't feel any shame, and um, I hope you're able to appreciate what I'm trying to do in this video and what I'm going to do in the next couple videos. Um, and uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll make another video next Sunday. Let me see if I can leave you with something. So one of the things that Spinoza does, guys, is he carves out a category of spirituality that is different from religion, which is very like, you know, now that we have New Age and we have all these other things, right? He carves out this category of spirituality which is different than religion, which I think, you know, you know regardless of how he filled out that category, I think it... it it serves us, right? So if you're an atheist or an agnostic, don't assume that you need to lack a spirituality, right? It's not a necessity. Like spirituality is not joined at the hip with religion, I think what that's what Spinoza does is he is he sort of shows that like no spirituality is different than religion dude right spirituality is uh it's a, it's a choice that you can make for yourself even if you're not religious you can choose to have a spirituality And that, that alone is, is really a, a beautiful thing that Spinoza gave to mankind. Even if you disagree with how he fills it out. Right. All right, guys. Thank you, and uh, I'll talk to you next week. Okay. Take care.